Good evening and welcome to Slam the Gavel, the show that tells it all regarding family court, other court issues, as well as CPS. I am your host, Marianne Petrie. I have a brand new guest. I have Reedy Chikaru on. She is a executive director of Our Children Matter the Most. Our Children Matter the Most is a children's rights advocacy nonprofit organization headquartered in Austin, Texas, with a mission to protect, preserve, and promote the rights of our children for the benefit of humanity. Our <coughs> Children Matter the Most collaborates with civil rights organization advocacy groups, family courts, and legislations to develop and implement creative campaigns to restore the rights of our children. So I welcome you, Reedy. I mean, how did all this come together and what got you into this? Marianne, thank you so much for having me on your incredible podcast. Oh, I have been you. following you for a little while, and I know you have viewers from all over the world, um, and they're watching because um, I went through something that many mothers and fathers have gone through. Um, that's what started this whole thing for me. It's a very personal struggle. I got um, uh, entangled in Texas family court, oh. um, um, false allegations made, and my children and I were separated. My two older children um, and I have not seen each other in two and a half years. Uh, but uh, my, you learn from children. You know, my middle son, uh, was reading about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I don't know how intuitively he said, mom, I think you should do, you know, a shanti walk or you should, you know, walk and protest and you should let people know what's going on. And really my children inspired me to make this uh, not just my problem, but also to uh, join forces with other people who have gone through what I have gone through in different states um, and, us get together and mm -hmm. find really this time find solutions because just standing together and voicing our problems just doesn't do anything you know it just exasperates the problem at best we all get as advocates we get exhausted and we get uh, uh we get we get fatigued there's a there's a huge amount of trauma that that is stored in our minds and in our bodies and we're not able to move and you know, achieve what we need to achieve by ourselves. So that's why I realized that there's strength in numbers and this is not a me problem. This is not, you know, a Marianne Petrie problem. This is a nationwide problem. And um, I guess I, I have to thank my children for helping me find purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when did your children tell you all of this? Um, throughout 2018 and 2019, Mm -hmm. um, I was ordered to have a paid supervised visitation uh, for no good cause, um, you know, false allegations. Uh, there were four criminal charges against me that were dismissed by the state uh, because there was nothing to it. But still, the protective order remained. And as a result of that, I was I am currently deemed a threat to my children. Oh. And the whole terminology of, you know, the family violence has been distorted in such a way that it's it's at first I thought it was just me it's I'm the one who's going through that and I shut myself off from the world in fact I went to a monastery and I lived there for a couple of months oh. uh, but when I started court watching and I started connecting with other parents and guardians and I realized I heard not just from parents and guardians but from other advocates other attorneys and the entire system itself is so dysfunctional mm -hmm. na nationwide that I think it's time for us to um, put our pens to paper, put our ideas, have a strategy and, and move towards a bigger goal and action plan. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm just grateful to be able to live my purpose. <laughs> and sometimes like I, I tell, <laughs> <laughs> like I tell people sometimes advocacy chooses you, whether you like it or not. Yes, in fact, um, I uh, somebody wrote an article um, on me online, and it said I was an activist by accident, and mm -hmm. that's really that's really what it is. Is um, I became so heavy in my pain and in my trauma uh, that 
I, I realized that the only way, it's very selfish, actually, the only way to uplift myself is to actually uplift and help other people. Mm -hmm. You know, luckily for me, you know, fathers love their children somewhat. And, you know, there, there isn't any horrible situation like sex, sexual abuse and physical abuse by the fathers. So uh, I'm very grateful to that. I know not everybody is lucky to have that kind of a scenario mm -hmm. when their kids are separated from them. You Several times, courts will hand over children to abusers, and it's just shocking. It's just, it's hard to even um, fathom it for the first several months to almost a year. I thought I was going crazy. I was like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. You know, but then when I started talking to other people and started seeing common elements and now a whole pattern state by state we're gathering data and now it's a nationwide issue i think it behooves us all of us as caretakers and guardians of our children who are our future for tomorrow to um to do right by them mm -hmm. because this will affect generations to come not just them but you know their generations that are coming down the pike Absolutely. And it affects our current scenario, too. I was, um, you know, a petroleum distributor in the state of Texas. I had a successful business. I was a functioning member, a taxpayer. I, I was, you know, I owned real estate and I was living the American dream as an immigrant, right? Mm -hmm. But family court put their, uh, got involved and got entangled and did not do right. A few bad actors did not do right by my children and I. <laughs> that it made me an extremely um, uh, almost dysfunctional person. I wasn't contributing anything to society. I became a burden. And imagine hundreds and thousands and millions of us, uh, it's affecting us today. That is why, according to National Associ Association of Mental Illness, the mental illness rate and suicide rates among families, and especially now, Marianne, the holiday time, that's the worst time because these times, are peak times that are used by bad actors in family courts nationwide to inflict like trauma mm -hmm. on on the unsuspecting parent and then take advantage of the situation. Um, so um, I really, you know, my heart goes out to all those families who are who are being dragged into family court this holiday season. Mm -hmm. Just you know, we're all here for you. You know, whoever you are, we're all here for you. You're not alone. So, you know, I, I just want to reach out to those people too. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult um, all around. And, you know, these children don't get to see their parents. So you, as a mother, you know, I, I wondered, gee, what, what are they thinking? You know, you know, I don't get to see them. They don't get to see me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously parental alienation occurs. Um, some children... Um, are, are lose their familial bonding uh, with the mother or father. Both parents are very important. Even grandparents are very important. Mm -hmm. And it creates this damaged, traumatized society. I mean, look at all the mass shootings. And mm -hmm. I mean, there was another one just a couple of days ago in West Virginia. Uh, these kind of things are happening because the very pillar of a person's you know, life and environment. Like when, when a family gets destroyed, it's just not the parent and the child. It's the immediate surroundings, the child's friends. It's the whole community that really bears the negative burden mm -hmm. of an attack on the family unit. Yeah, but, but we can change it. That's the thing is that we can change it because historically changes have been made when any segment of society has been marginalized like, you know, the African-Americans in South Africa, whether it's the, you know, untouchables and, you know, in, in India, whether any segment of society that has been marginalized and has, you know, has had their um, rights taken them, from them, um, eventually enough of us will be like, enough is enough. Let's, let's hold hands and let's raise awareness and let's not just protest. There is a great reason for protesting and voicing, but let's do something about it. You know, let's create campaigns around it and let's have a strategic action plan to, to minimize at least the 
future damage and then try to go back and get involved in restoring justice, restorative justice. Um, so this is the dialogue happening and I'm very excited to say that things are changing. I'm seeing it, at least in Texas. You know, tell me about the shanty walk. You had mentioned that earlier and I don't know, maybe some people don't know what that means. Sure, certainly. Um, so Our Children Matter Most is a, a nonprofit organization headquartered in Austin, like you said, and uh, we follow the uh, nonviolent direct action uh, campaign. That's our foundation, that's our principle, which means we want to, there, there are multiple steps in a nonviolent campaign. The first step is to, there's has to be a finding of fact that a certain group of people are being marginalized. And yes, we have those facts. We have those demographics. We have those numbers. Then the second one is when you notice that there is a segment of society being marginalized, uh, we've got to, you know, uh, we've got to do self-purification. Th these are Martin Luther King's words. Self-purification means self-healing because if we are not healed ourselves, then we're not going to be able to, you know, even function, let alone uh, stand and testify in front of legislator or, you know, do the hard work that is needed and required to make a change, mm -hmm. right? So the Shanti walk, uh, is a peace walk and that it's it is a way to not only raise awareness and gather more data but it's a self-purification process it is a I've, we've already done a couple of shanti walks we've i've done 150 miles last year in 2021 from brownwood texas to the texas state capitol walking every day with my two beautiful dogs luke and lex oh. you know and we were joined by several parents and I can tell you, uh, there were times when I was crying and I was feeling humble and I was feeling strength. It was uh, this overwhelming sensation of healing came over me and seeing other parents uh, walking with me. Um, I, I didn't feel alone. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't I, I didn't feel like this is just my fight, you know, and they felt the same way, too. So uh, it's also it's a self purification process, a peace walk. Um, we've done one in Texas in 2021. One one in California has happened, uh, and we are about to start another one um, on November 20th, World Children's Day. We're going to be walking for 10 days throughout November till the end of the month, and the response, Marianne, is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, we are encouraging parents to come get out of their homes walk get some endorphins moving do some movement therapy very simple right it's just a peace walk we're going to be walking together we're going to do some sound healing we're going to hear each other's stories but we're also going to start strategizing um, so as i said the force the the steps to a nonviolent campaign. We've got the data. We're doing self purification. We'll also be doing like workshops, online workshops, as well as in person workshops, helping our um, traumatized family members who are separated from their children to transmute their pain into relief. And only community can help that kind of healing. We can't do that alone. So after self purification comes a negotiation change a stage in a nonviolent direct direct action campaign. The negotiation stage is very exciting because we have NAACP of Austin, uh, which is an incredible civil rights company, as you know, who was instrumental uh, in in Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. Uh, huge, been in existence since 1919. They have a substantial legal defense team, uh, and they are have some heavy influence on lawmakers and on Congress. Uh, but the NAACP in Austin has recognized that our children's rights are being violated. The president, uh, Mr. Nelson Linder, is very supportive um, of our campaign. And, and with organizations like NAACP, and we've reached out to LULAC, which is the similar, but it's the Latin American counterpart of NAACP. Um, and then ACLU, uh, we're, you know, we're asking for more advocacy groups and more parent, you know, um, uh, civil rights organizations to join forces with us. At this negotiation stage, we have loosely put together uh, a 
a commission um, idea called the Truth, Consequences, and Reconciliation Commission, or the TCR process. It's based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of um, uh, that was put forth by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela in South Africa. Um, so, and, and that's where we hope we will have the option to negotiate and bring justice to those families that have been unjustly treated by a few bad actors in family court and their affiliates. Uh, uh, and we believe if that is an open thing, uh, you know, the government wants to do right by us, most of them, They're, but a few bad actors are so loud and they are so effective at committing this psychological warfare on our families. Um, and we are traumatized and we're silent. Um, so, so we don't hear about it. But when the truth comes out, uh, after that, we are looking towards our faith leaders and our civic leaders and you know uh, mental health support specialists to help with the reconciliation of, um, of families. Because like you, I don't know what my two other, old, my older sons are, you know, how are they going to be? Because I haven't seen them, you know, in person in over two and a half years. Mm. I've seen my little one, that relationship is getting, is being negotiated. And that father seems to be a little bit reasonable, but the two older ones, I have the same fear as a mom is, are they, are they going to accept me? Are they, is there going to be turmoil? How would I, you know, deal with something like that? So, but I do need the help of professionals to help with this reunification process. Mm -hmm. So I think once people start seeing a, one family after the other family go through this very public uh, truth bearing, truth speaking, um, and there will be some consequences. If there are some criminal or civil repercussions, there will be some consequences. But those can be uh, what can be negotiated away and what can uh, be reconciled to as much as possible, put the family back together. That is a campaign that we, it's an action plan that we're very excited about. So healing one family at a time. Sorry, that was a little bit long. But no, that was I excellent. Just Okay. No, that was very well said. About the consequences, um, as far as what an attorney has done or what a judge has done, is that where the consequences will fall? I think a bit of both. I think a bit of both. Because um, we've got to see who has committed the crimes against our children, to what extent, how many families have been affected, um, and can rest, is there a place for restorative justice? Can families, you know, can we instill faith back in the judiciary? Um, mm -hmm. And they want to do that too, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they want to do that too. And so if there are a few bad actors who mm -hmm. are, you know, who are, going through hundreds and hundreds of cases, then of course there are going to be consequences. They have to be debenched or there's, and there's also legal action. Nobody's stopping us from taking legal action. That's one of the reasons why we're really excited that an NAACP is involved and other civil rights in organizations are involved because there are going to be legal consequences and repercussions. And most likely these are going to be mass, you know, class action lawsuits at no cost to the uh, to the families or minimal cost to the families. Um, I think it's important. This is um, this is how change happens, and we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just studying what was done um, in South Africa. We're just you know doing what was done in the Gandhian movement and the Quit India movement. Uh, you know, it's not just voicing our problems, but the consequences are there. And sometimes there may be criminal consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, society must hold its elected officials accountable. Um, so I guess a little bit of, you know, a bit of both. But I think the great consequence, the positive consequence of that is that there will be healing. You know, it's like we're all so wounded. We can't just cover up our wounds. 
and let it fester. We've got to bring the wound out, give it, you know, open it up. And that's not going to be a pretty sight, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but we're going to have strong leadership in place who can handle this kind of leadership and who can lead people and say, okay, we've got to fester that wound. And we've got to make sure that this doesn't happen again to other families. Um, and through sunlight and natural elements, that's how the wound heals. So that's a great consequences. It's going to be a wonderful and challenging journey, I believe. Oh, yes. It sounds very, um, it sounds exciting because I think it will give parents hope that, you know, um, the trauma they went through of losing their children, because we don't know if the, they will come back. We don't know what they're thinking. We just don't know because a judge has caused parental alienation and or the opposing attorney has caused an installed parental alienation just by making things up as they go along and the parent would feel uh vindicated and it's so important to feel that justice you got justice somewhere you know it might might be a little late but at least it was recognized yes i mean in certain situations when children have died in the care of, you know, CPS or died in the hands of, uh, you know, abusive parents, uh, actually one or two of them are very interested in spearheading some of our campaigns because they want to speak up. And I hats off to those people mm -hmm. because these are really strong people. Their children are not alive anymore. And, but they want to, uh, they want to take their pain and transmute it into something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what humanity is about. We cannot keep repeating our same mistakes. Otherwise, we're not going to survive as a, as a whole race. You know, that's what our mission is, is to protect, promote, and preserve the rights of our children for the benefit of humanity, you know? Um, so I'm, um, I'm very hopeful. I'm very determined. It gives me um, and our leadership like an action plan. So there's not, not just hope, there is a clean action plan. And now we have an organization like NAACP Austin, and hopefully we'll get nationwide assistance as well. Uh, so uh, keeping my finger, keeping my fingers crossed and one step in front of the other, Shanti walking. <laughs> right, right. Because it is insane to keep letting family court and CPS continue their mistakes. And we're just letting it's, it's insanity just to let them continue on this path that they've, yeah. they've been on yeah. this path for so many years. Some of us have become insane, mm -hmm. you know, because some, some, some of us have dri been driven to the point of mental breakdown, financial breakdown, mm -hmm. you know, physical breakdown. So we've got to, push ourselves and we've got to help and we've got to motivate each other to get up out of bed and come out and say, Hey, you know what, if you're having a bad day, so-and-so mom and dad, that's okay. 10 others are here for you. So let's create that, uh, you know, that community. So we don't feel like we're alone in this battle. There's strength in numbers. Oh. And that when that energy builds up, when we're out of our computer screens, our telephones, and we're in person, um, shanti walking and talking and, you know, and strategizing. Uh, it's a different kind of energy. That's the most basic human, you know, connection that, that I think will, will help us. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Um, with the NAACP, have they um, reached out to the judiciary at all and had spoken with them? in regards to these issues of family court? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, they weren't even aware that this was going on, is what I was told, um, that this was such a, you know, such a uh, systemic issue. Um, and I think that's because there are two reasons, uh, is that we parents have, have PTSD. You know, either we don't speak up because of trauma, Mm -hmm. Or second, if we dare to speak up, we will be thrown in jail. It happened to me four times and there'll be gag orders on us, mm -hmm. you know, and these are unconstitutional. This is a direct violation and attack on freedom of speech. I should mm -hmm. be able to talk to the press what happened to me and my family. Uh, um, 
but the minute I do, I am, um, um, I am punished for it, you mm-hmm. know, and it's not a small, small thing. Every time you go to jail and come out, it's your life is totally imbalanced. And right. And you, you, you also take your life you in your hands. I'm so sorry. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, oh, because... no, this is great. Well, and, yeah. Oh, you go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you is that, you know, and, you know, you and I, I heard your story on the Greg Ellis show. Um, it's, it's incredibly shocking what you went through and how they wouldn't um, give you your prescription medication that you needed. And as a result, your entire life has changed. Mm-hmm. Your body has changed how you are as a person has changed um and trauma will do that Mm -hmm. Uh, but if we a few of us can gather the courage and few of us can just keep going back and showing our strength in numbers and now with the assistance of civil rights organization we are able to show that this is a systemic pattern Mm -hmm. um then um, change for the better is inevitable Uh, There may be some families that won't be able to get to in time or in certain states, but, and that is heartbreaking, which is why we're looking for leaders um, who can start local chapters in different, in different states. I'm currently in Las Vegas doing that. After that, we have someone in uh, California who wants to start a chapter too and start this as a grassroots organization. And it's the same action plan, nonviolent direct action campaign. We Mm -hmm. need a seat at the table gone long enough and here are the negative impacts of what happens not just to us but it's also burdensome to the economy it's burdens burdensome to the judiciary themselves mm. um it, overall it is creating a huge weight um on our country mm-hmm. um and you know i i believe that the family is the pillar of a democratic society and mm-hmm. if the, you attack that then you are no <laughs> you're very like you're not gonna your question of a superpower is going to remain a question. So we need to get our families back together intact. Mm -hmm. Another ultimate problem is CPS, where they feel they can go into your home and just remove your children based on false accusations or just go in and move your children. Uh, You know, do you... They get compensated for Mm -hmm. that. Yes, yes. They get compensated for removing your children through for the foster care system. There is, you've just follow the money and you see that trail, but what they don't realize is for that, for the, the price that, that, that they, that they now have to pay is families are awakening. And this is going to be a, this is a huge problem. There's outcries, as you know, there's so many Facebook cr- uh, groups, parents are marching in front of judges' houses. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we are at a point where we're like, enough is enough, enough is enough. So right. here's the truth. Here's the truth. Let's, you know, have, there's going to be some consequences. And we're not going to, you know, um, act in a manner that is violent in, in speech or in action, but here are the consequences here. This is, you know, where we followed the money. Now let's negotiate and let's start reconciling. Let's fix, fix this. It is the burden of fixing our society and our community goes to us, you know, us, our wounded warriors, as I call ourselves, those shanty <laughs> warriors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. And when, hmm, I don't know how to word this to say, I don't want to sound stupid, but these judges, not all of them, but most of them are personality disorders and uh, sociopaths, along with these family law um, at the bottom of the pond dwelling attorneys. And the thing is, uh, the, these people have to be brought to justice and held accountable for what they've done. And are parents going to bring you transcripts and go over what had happened? I mean, this is going to be a mammoth task to criminalize these judges and attorneys, not only for physical, sexual, child abuse, but a child psychological abuse, as well as a death of a child. Yeah. 
Um, well, the system is this this. This system, this monster has become so big, it's grown so many eyes and legs and, you know, that you chop one leg and, you know, you're like, there's 10 others to do right. it. <laughs> right. And so it is a mammoth monster. So we can't say, oh, we're going to fix all the family court issues. We're not going to do that. What we're doing is right now we're addressing one, one thing that is the protective order reform, reform, uh, reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that campaign is starting is in Texas because, and it's also called a no contact order in certain states. Um, these are this is a tool that is thoroughly misused by bad actors in family court, where if for a very small price, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars maximum, ten ten thousand dollars, they go in. You know, um, about an unethical attorney will. Um, or even an you know unethical district attorney or county attorney will issue a protective order against you know the innocent parent, mm. and the assumption is you're guilty first until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Which even um, you know licensed attorneys now are speaking up against and talking that protective orders are unconstitutional. So that itself is one specific task that we're going to deal with this one issue first, state by state. Um, and, and as a part of that, if there's, if there, because it's very clear to see if there's harm committed on a child, then of course there, there is a need for a protective order, but mm -hmm. if there's no harm and these are just false allegations and hearsay that must be fixed, mm -hmm. there's, there's no if, and, and buts, it has to be fixed. And then we can see a pattern on which we're seeing. I don't want to give too much detail on how we're categorizing data yet, but um, because all kinds of people listen to your podcast and we don't want to be caught disadvantaged, but we will present this data. There's nothing to hide about it. One, every, one particular judge has is, you know, is creating this racket scheme with the guardian ad litem and one or two attorneys and is doing these protective orders. And it happens county by county. They have a system, mm -hmm. you know, so when we catch that, um, then we hold those people responsible. Now, e that could be either from filing judicial complaints, not from just individual parents, but also civil rights organizations. And when a civil rights organization files a complaint against a public official, I assure you, it will be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so the most egregious, there are usually uh, just a handful of bad judges, you know, in each each district is what we've noticed. That's what the data is telling us. But obviously we don't have enough data. And that is why I wanna hear from parents if they've got a protective order issue. Is it, is it false, based on false allegations? How long is the protective order for? Um, and what is the result? And was it misused in family court? Um, so just looking at the paperwork, you can clearly see that these have to immediately go into negotiation and they must be negotiated five cases, 10 cases a day. So we've got to create a anti-machine system to fix all of these, all of these issues. Um, um, the CPS, that's a way bigger problem than, you know, than our small organization can handle right now, but we are willing to work. And that is why we want to work in collaboration with other advocacy organizations. Um, I think CPS, there's a flow of money there that requires legislative changes. Mm -hmm. And we've got some really exciting ideas. Like there are some really good judges who try to do well, but because of peer pressure, they, they can't. Uh, they issue an order and then another judge reverses the order and does something totally different. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't want those good judges to be left out. We wanna reward them. We wanna give them the honor that they, that they need. We wanna support them as a community. We wanna to donate to their campaign funds. And we want to, uh, we want to make doing good a profitable thing uh some you know something that uh people can look look forward to doing you know and um and there have been changes you know there have been um, attorneys as well who have spoken to us off the record very openly and said do you think i want to do this family law stuff i gotta feed my family i mean i have just become almost suicidal look at this case look at this case don't quote me on this i don't want to show you an information but this is what's happening i i, I want to get out if, if there's a way that we can start you know minimizing the damage um you know even family court attorneys are 
uh, they deal with a lot of trauma and, you know, um, and a heavy burden of guilt for doing the wrong thing. Because as officers of the court, they have to uphold justice and, you know, and they have to apply the law correctly, but they aren't unable to because their opposing side is doing something, you know. So mm -hmm. we've got some people who are willing to, from both from within the system and from outside the system, which is why it's so exciting is that that's when change can be possible. If when inside and outside, we are like, okay, this problem has gone way too big and we need to resolve it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where we are at. Now, some of these family court lawyers actually enjoy tearing a family apart. You know, sometimes yeah, those are some. <laughs> oh no, go ahead, say that again. <laughs> those are those are you know psychopaths and sociopaths, <laughs> egomaniacs. Um, um, you know those uh, those kind of people. They're 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 going to have to face you know the people's jury because very, very, everything is pretty open and they're not going to be able to avoid um, either they have to alter their behavior. Uh, they'll have to be reprimanded. They'll have to either be debenched, uh, but there has to be some consequence, which is why the C part of the TCR is very, very important. Once the truth comes out, there will be consequences. There may be, there will definitely be legal action. Um, you know, and it's not one or two people, strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's going to be reconciliation. So I love this action plan. It keeps helping me to stay on track and mm -hmm. not get, you know, um, drifted away by my, my, my pain or the pain of other families, um, you know, and so I'm so sorry. And yes, we, we uh, commune with each other and we feel badly for each other, but at the same time, we're not, uh, nothing productive is coming out of that, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, keeping an action plan literally keeps me alive, Marianne. It really does. Mm -hmm. I mean, without an action plan, I would probably just be comatose and I have yes. been that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can understand that. You know, staying busy and helping others and doing what you're doing. Um, how long have you been doing this? Uh, since 2019. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I got threats. I was harassed to no end. Um, listen, okay, <laughs> listen to this, this particular attorney, I will mention his name. His name is Ryan, was Ryan Duguay. Um, and he was uh, out of control. Mm -hmm. This attorney was out of control. He was backdating uh, orders. And he just made himself a liability to the entire, you know, to the entire Travis County family court and, you know, judicial system. Um, it went so far to the point and he did it to several families and I was like there's no way that I can deal with this person because he's not a reasonable person he was contacting my uh, um, uh, my landlords um, my the person the title company when I was trying to sell my lake house I mean my real estate agent he it, contacting you know organizers of the Miss America Foundation I mean, this guy was just in unbelievable, out of control. And I had no idea what to do because every complaint was being ignored and nobody could control this person. But guess oh. what? I'm a person of faith. I prayed really hard. This year in July, I got news uh, that he just died. He just <laughs> dropped. Sorry, that, that was unprofessional. <laughs> And I mean, I didn't know whether to, I, did, I, I mean, I was like, there is a God, there is divine <laughs> justice, because I'm not going to lie to you. I have sat and prayed so many times. I have screamed up to the heavens and I said, I want you to come down and strike these people wrongdoers down with thunder and lightning. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was very dramatic, but um, hey, one less person, you know, right? Um, right. I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, dying is a is a bad thing. I think it was the end of uh, everybody has to die. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I I don't think there's anything disrespectful. Um, I just think it's universal humor. You know, mm -hmm. um, justice justice was served. Just, divine justice was served, and I think 
this person has now created such a trail of mess oh, uh, so yeah. many families in Travis County that we now have to you know help mm-hmm. um so yeah um I'm, I think faith having faith and knowing that there is a higher power the kind of energy that you get from that um, the signs that you get and the people that meet that you meet is just unexplainable. And I've always been a very spiritual person. I meditate. I believe in the law of attraction. I believe what you think about, you bring about. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm very, very sorry. You know, I hope I mean, in fact, I, I even pray and I say, now to gay, come and fix this. And now you have superpowers. Come and fix the mess you made. You right. know, <laughs> that's right. what I say. And I, and he's gone back and into pure consciousness. And hopefully in this, you know, things, things are just working out. And I, it's difficult to speak in a esoteric way like this, because some people don't believe in all of those things, but I do. And I believe that having faith and belief in some higher power um, has benefited me and benefited our cause greatly. Definitely. Because, yeah. you know, I've told, I've told people, I said, you know, let God deal with these people. Just say, you know, dear God, remove them from my life. Yes. And it happened to me as well with the one attorney. Um, She was horrible. I mean, a a total walking nightmare (laughs) dressed in in some weird Pepto-Bismol pink pleather motorcycle jacket. But I said, God, get her out of my life because she's she's horrible. So God gave her cancer. So then her husband took the case. I could deal with him. Okay. Even though he's a perpetual liar, I had to deal with him. Then the judge, and I think I told you that the judge and the, the opposing attorney were BFFs in the courthouse. So I told, yeah. I told God, I said, get this judge out of my life. Just, yeah. you know, just, you know, and so uh, one of my friends called me while I was shopping and she said, did you know the judge died? Oh. And I said, what? How, how do you know? She said, they announced it on the news. And I actually, here I am in a shopping mall dropping to my knees. I saying, wow. thank you, Jesus. Right. It's the power of prayer. And I bet you, you're not the only person who was praying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. If if someone just doesn't understand, if someone is beyond the point of um, reason and beyond the point of, you know, undoing harm against others and wants to continue in a way, um, nature comes in, steps in. You, the universe, Mother Nature, God, Jesus, whoever you believe in, comes in and, you know, puts an end. I think that is called karma. That is, you know, the balance of life. That's incredible. And did your case like ease up after that? Well, not really, because we got a judge that was pulled out of retirement who looked like he was 90 years old, but really he was, I looked up his age, he was 70, but I'm telling you, he looked 20 years older than his stated age. Yeah. Because when I saw him, it's like, is he going to get this? Because our file was this thick, okay? And, you know, he did he did not rule with any due process. He just did whatever the opposing attorney guided him to do, because he can't think for himself. He, he wouldn't do it. So we, I had all these people filled up on my pews of the courtroom and he just came out for maybe 10 minutes and then he picked up and he was walking off mm-hmm. and I yelled at him, your honor, my children are being neglected. He, you know, it's it just, Oh it, yes. It, you know, the other thing that helps me, Marion is to think of uh, humor, you know, dark humor. Oh, when there is. Go- <laughs> When you go to a point of such pain where, you know, your options are a either, sorry, you know, this is not a joking matter. Either you end your life and I've never been suicidal. Thank God. Um, in, in this scenario, at least when I was a teen, you know, I had, um, some thoughts like that, but never, you know, Mm -hmm. I love life too much, you know, um, and I'm grateful for that, Mm -hmm. but you either, you know, either that happens or you just begin to see the ridiculous dark humor in, (laughs) in everything. And you're just like, okay, you want to put, you know, put me in handcuffs and, you know, in ball and chain, make me shuffle around. And you have to try so hard to break my spirit down. 
uh, but it's not going to work because mm -hmm. I'm free in my mind. You can shackle me all you want. I'm free mm -hmm. in my mind. That's what I was telling this judge. And I was waving to him like I was, you know, in an island. And I felt at first I felt ridiculous, but I was like, excuse me, judge, are you even listening to me? Right. And, and he was just literally throwing my, my motion that I had typed up in the air, like confetti. And I just, for a moment, everything looked like it was in slow motion. And I just stopped and I said, wow, really? Is this how, is this, is this how ridiculously humorous and dark that, that my <laughs> life has become, you know? And I was yeah. just, it, it was, it was a really rough, that was in 2018. It was a really, really rough time for me. And then they put a GPS ankle monitor on my leg <sighs> for three months, starting on mother's day. Oh um, my God. See, they do this stuff around holidays, certain holidays. Yes. But see, if you know that, if I had known that this was intentionally uh, uh, planned psychological warfare, warfare, I would have, I wouldn't have succumbed to it. You know, here I am trying to reason with someone on the opposite side who's unreasonable, mm -hmm. uh, who's just made their decision already and having an opinion probably irritated them even more, you know, mm -hmm. and me trying to talk about my rights and my constitutional rights and history and all of that. Uh, I have to laugh at myself because yeah. if I don't laugh at myself, <laughs> who else is going to laugh? You know, they, they made me, you know, put a GPS ankle monitor on me and name public buildings in Austin as protected places like the Austin Convention Center. And I was thinking, wow, you know, it reminded me of a joke mm -hmm. that my dad once made. My dad is a retired police chief in India. And I was leaving India in 2004. Um, so I was, you know, going to the airport in India. And because he was a retired police chief, there were people around. There was a police officers, constables helping us through everything. It was, And they were bringing me a cup of tea. Somebody was taking my bags to the plane. Somebody was holding my passport. And I was like, wow, this is VIP treatment over here. And I told my dad, I, I said, Pa, why are there so many police officers here today oh, in the no. airport? So he says they've come to see the biggest terrorist off. <laughs> 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 and I just rolled my eyes. And, uh, you know, I, I joked with my dad about that when obviously when I healed my pain a little bit and, you know, I was able to grapple the reality of the situation and mm -hmm. And I told my dad, just look at this GPS ankle monitor on my leg. And then, I mean, I'm the biggest terrorist of all, mm -hmm. you know, I may be on the FBI watch list, which is really ironic because, you know, former director of FBI and CIA are good friends of my dad's. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just laugh at myself, you know, when things go so bad and just that one thing, just, I'm like, okay, all right, let's, let's move forward from this this crazy episode you, you know, know if uh, if, I, if i were you when i gave the gps you know ankle bracelet back i probably would have yeah. had little hello kitty stickers all over it <laughs> here <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, 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 I wore the uh, ankle monitor and i represented india in the miss world pageant so that was, uh, and I got a standing ovation from a few judges because one of the judges was a very strong uh, animal rights activist and he was um, doing this campaign, anti some PETA campaign and he got house arrested and he had a GPS ankle monitor, which I didn't know, you know? So um, I, I took that and um, of course, you know, there were people who were judging me incredibly, but I only listened to people who knew me well and who um, commended me for not hiding and not being ashamed because I didn't do anything wrong. Right. You see, if I did something wrong, I would be the first person to say, I, 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 I did this wrong. I'm self-guided that way. Mm -hmm. But what they did to me and my children are just, um, mm -hmm. just, just tw straight out of Twilight Zone, Marianne, mm -hmm. <laughs> straight out of Twilight Zone. Well, I found, yeah. you know, like watching a sociopath, uh, like the opposing attorney I had, I, you know, was watching him. I'm going, he's really into dramatics. He would take his hands and just, you know, do this and, you know, 
all these gestures. I'm going, maybe I should try that. So I did. <laughs> and it went on for months until he caught on because I saw him watching me. He like actually turned because he would never look at me, but he turned his head and he was looking at me, go, your honor, you know, doing, just doing the same thing he was doing. And then the next time we were in a hearing, he kept his hands to his sides while he talked. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. I, yeah. There's, I think there's a whole uh, psychological patterning. There's, there, there's uh, things that they have learned on what they need to do. Like you said, pick certain holiday days or key dates and mm -hmm. without notice, serve your ex parte temporary restraining order because then you're just a normal person is just like shocked mm -hmm. and you are immediately put in a place of defending yourself you know mm -hmm. um that's what they want the more traumatized you are um, um the better it is for an unethical unethical you know people to um the more traumatized and the more alone you are right. but if you have a community and if you have serious advocacy and you've got a courtroom of people watching, whole different story. Ever since COVID has, you know, made all these hearings virtual and online, uh, the same judges who would speak to me in such a disrespectful tone um, uh, suddenly are addressing me as Ms. Chikarur. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it has to be that way. But for some people, uh, it has to be that way. Um, we cannot expect everybody to be uh, acting on their own goodwill and their own honor. Um, that's why people like you and me are are here because we right. talk about it and we shed light on the subject. Because there needs to be oversight. And I'm glad that the NAACP is getting involved in this. Yes. Because, uh, and you said the ACLU and the NU, yeah. NU, NULAC? LAC? L U L A C. Okay. Yeah. It we helps. haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm pretty sure that they will, um, that they will get involved because they're, they are required to mm -hmm. um, look into matters uh, that affect um, large numbers of people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they do. And once we show them the data and statistics in an organized manner, I am fully confident that they would they will come on board and we will um, we will deal with this um, systematically state by state. Right. Because it appears that the judiciary isn't concerned with child psychological abuse at all. Or they're they're looking at a target parent. And that's who they're going to take the children away, which is causing child psychological abuse. It's very simple. Um, I don't think they really care about the children. Obviously, right. they don't. It's really, it's really about the money. Sorry right. to say this, but it's it's just about the money. Usually, uh, the person who's who can afford bigger legal fields, uh, fees and um, the person who is able to buy that decision or that ruling or that order uh, will have the case, you know, in their in their favor. It's mm -hmm. it's truly only about the money. Mm -hmm. And of course, for some bad actors, there's, you know, the the there's a mental illness and those kind of things involved, but those kind of but those kind of situations, uh, you, you cannot stay in public office for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, people eventually catch up, and um, you know the state, the judicial commission, or um, you know, public integrity unit, or Texas Rangers, or whoever mm -hmm. is there, will usually uh, you know um, identify these people and and remove them from office, or they will remove themselves. You know, mm -hmm. there have been a few judges that have. Uh, ended their own lives um, mm -hmm. as a result of uh, investigation that was commenced. It wasn't in Texas. I believe it was in, um, I think it was West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, there's a lot of court watchers on Zoom to support target parents going through this ugly system. And I was court watching last week where the judge, um, the, the mother was a pro se litigant and she was speaking and he says, I'm putting you on mute. Like he was just tired of hearing her and he just put her on mute. And it's like, you can't do that. 
uh, you know, I was just like, and he did it a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Um, to to speak to both sides of that, I think um, it's very important to uh, first reach out to court watchers. I used to be one, and uh, it's a draining, draining job. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not lucrative. Um, it it just is it becomes almost like caregiver fatigue Mm -hmm. there's advocacy for fatigue is that just listening to these constant stories if you don't take care of yourself as a court watcher and if you don't have the support and you're not getting getting anywhere with trying to resolve these issues and trying to truly help these families god bless court watchers and you know Mm -hmm. advocates spend their own time and resources to do that um there's a place you know for for people like people like you who do court watching um well you know that we've got to bring them into the fold of a uh-huh. bigger a bigger uh solution and it has to be more just data gathering and giving them the support that they need um mm-hmm. you know to uh, to actually help the family truly yes human yes. beings i believe that most human beings are are good they really are i've heard I, I had a good life and, you know, I've had good friends. And even despite this difficulty, I've met some amazing people who genuinely care. People who gave me a home. I was homeless at one point, living in a tent. Mm-hmm. Uh, as recently as, you know, a couple of years ago, I was, I was, oh. I didn't have money to eat food. Um, but people have literally just, without any bad agenda or motivation, random strangers have just been so kind to mm-hmm. me. That, um, um, that I feel like it's my my chance to and my turn to pay it forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to get uh, in touch with you and this group that um, you started, um, how do they get into? How do they get in touch with you? To telepathy? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was only that easy. Messages shine a light in the sky and we'll be there yeah <laughs> i wish right i wish we had batman and superman and all of those superheroes but truthfully speaking um it's uh, w our website is www.ourchildrenmattermost.org uh people can also email us at info at ourchildrenmattermost.org um and we can also be reached by phone during regular work hours 512-662-95 three zero um you can also use our contact form if you want to just leave your first and last name and or if you want to be confidential you don't want you're concerned um all our conversations are confidential and we are at a point where we are gathering information if you have a protective order issue let's talk about that if you want to collaborate in some way if you want to start a shanti walk in a different state i mean let's and this is what i do full time so i'm here I eat, sleep, breathe, uh, breathe this because like I said earlier, um, I I only have one child out of three and even that not, it's at the wish and will and the fancy of the other parent. Mm -hmm. Um, So I need support too. I need emotional support and help. Um, So just do, you know, continuing to do this, I need support in order to get my children back. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's why I reached out to NAACP um, and other civil rights organizations and to make the case to them that it's not just a Riti Chikarur issue. Um, mm-hmm. This is way bigger than that. And it's too big for some one or two or even 10 people to handle. Mm-hmm. All of us need to come together um, and have an action plan and work on that and do whatever we can if you cannot walk then please donate you know we work off of donations i really appreciate that it helps us um it helps us you know work with volunteers and do our advertising and marketing and get keep the machine going Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but most most importantly i want to say um just just don't give up hope just don't give up hope you know um yeah. Well, 
Um, don't jump off. Slam the Gavels, the podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in these family courtrooms. I'm your host, Marianne Petri, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth. Please join us again here with Reedy in the future, because I'm going to have her back. And we will talk again. Thank you so much, Reedy. Thank you so much, Marianne. And I just want to give a shout out to our Shanti Walk, people interested in that. It's on November 20th. That's also on our website. Uh, if you cannot walk, if you're in a different state, then please donate and uh, don't give up. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.